And I'm Brian Hoyt. I'm a, a cardiologist at University Hospital Case Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, this morning, I, I talked a little bit about atrial functional mitral regurgitation with the subheading, uh, the left atrium finally gets its due respect. Now, moderate or severe mitral regurgitation uh, is the most common valve disease in the United States with an estimated prevalence over 2 million, and it is expected to double by 2030. Mitral regurgitation can be classified into the uh, intrinsic uh, or primary mitral regurgitation, or it may be functional. And generally, it is thought that functional mitral regurgitation requires annular dilatation and normal mitral valve leaflets, uh, but leaflets that are tethered because of left ventricular remodeling. One of the uh, interesting uh, questions is whether or not annular dilatation, uh, enlargement of the mitral annulus alone, would be sufficient to cause significant mitral regurgitation. Now, the mitral annulus is key in this. The mitral annulus is a thin fibro fatty uh, uh, structure that is uh, as planar, it's saddle shaped, uh, and is bordered on each side by atrial and ventricular uh, myocardial fibers. So the non-planarity of the mitral annulus is thought to reduce stress on the mitral leaflets, and the associated myocardial fibers is thought to play an important sphincteric role which reduces the uh, annular area uh, to about 25% during the cardiac cycle. There have been a couple uh, interesting uh, animal studies which have highlighted the importance of the uh, muscu atrial musculature and, and some musculature of the anterior mitral leaflet itself. And uh, these were discussed and set the stage for whether or not uh, atrial enlargement, mitral annular enlargement, uh, would be important in the genesis of uh, mitral regurgitation uh, by exerting stress on the posterior mitral leaflet and by altering the planarity of the mitral annulus. Uh, despite these interesting studies, the majority of the echocardiographic studies uh, in lone atrial fibrillation, so there is no left ventricular remodeling, uh, have really indicated uh, or certainly uh, suggested strongly that uh, the functional mitral regurgitation is much more closely related to incomplete mitral leaflet closure area than it is mitral annular area. And in fact, in that study, a multivariable uh, analysis found uh, that incomplete uh, mitral leaflet closure but not mitral annular area uh, was an independent uh, predictor of uh, mitral regurgitation, data which uh, confirmed the notion uh, that mitral annular dilatation uh, alone is not sufficient for uh, the development of mitral regurgitation. Uh, but a few years uh, ago, a couple studies uh, uh, came out to suggest that perhaps uh, mitral annular dilatation would be sufficient. Um, and I, I discussed those in uh, some deal of uh, depth. The, the important one was a, a study uh, that looked at uh, from over uh, 800 patients uh, who presented for a first time atrial fibrillation uh, ablation. And uh, from this, uh, these 800 or so uh, patients, they identified 53 uh, who had uh, uh, mitral annular dilatation, um, severe or moderate or severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, and uh, uh, normal left ventricular size and function. Uh, the patients uh, were then controlled. Uh, by, the patients were compared to a uh, control group uh, from those same uh, 800 patients, uh, but they did not have a significant mitral regurgitation. Uh, all of the patients, uh, however, had normal left ventricular size and function. Uh, the groups differed in terms of their age, so patients with mitral regurgitation were older. Uh, the patients had more, uh, the patients were older, 
there was more persistent uh, atrial fibrillation. They had larger index left atrial volumes and increased mitral annular size. In uh, that study, the uh, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> Um, I usually go off of uh, slides. All right. Uh, so the, uh, the patients who had a successful ablation, that is, uh, they maintained their sinus rhythm, uh, were compared to those who were back in atrial fibrillation. And uh, the patients uh, who uh, persisted in uh, sinus rhythm uh, had smaller index left atrial volume, smaller mitral annular area, and a highly significantly lower uh, rate of moderate or severe mitral regurgitation, 24 versus 84 percent. So these are, uh, this was a, a, an interesting, rather provocative study, but uh, because of its retrospective design should be uh, considered to be a hypothesis generated. I also discussed a couple surgical uh, series uh, that are, were both uh, uh, retrospective uh, and uh, had only a handful of patients, uh, but they too supported the notion that annular dilatation alone uh, results in mitral regurgitation uh, that can be, in many cases, cured by uh, annuloplasty. Um, so the mechanisms of this atrial functional mitral regurgitation are not entirely known, but they almost certainly relate in part to the atrial fibrillation induced atrial remodeling. Uh, another interesting uh, hypothesis is that there is a, a tethering, an atriogenic tethering of the posterior mitral leaflet uh, that's responsible, uh, but this again uh, is just an interesting hypothesis that should be uh, tested. Now the conclusions uh, of this, uh, this talk were um, firstly that um, atrial functional mitral regurgitation is, uh, is a uh, appears to be a real uh, entity, uh, and while it is uh, seen in only 6.4% uh, of patients presenting for an atrial fibrillation, the explosive uh, prevalence of, of atrial fibrillation suggests that atrial functional mitral regurgitation may be more common than uh, previously thought. And this has uh, some very important implications for maintaining sinus rhythm uh, when one is deciding on a rhythm or, or rate control strategy for the treatment of uh, atrial fibrillation.